field of sleep? Yes, I know. This is actually uh, one question that I'd like to ask. Last time when I came here for the first time, I did not know anything about you, and so I did not know anything about the group, and I hardly knew anything about Sufism. And so since I left you last week and came back today, I had the chance to read your book, The Chasm of Fire. And of course, when reading the book, many, many questions are answered. But for the people who have not uh, had the chance to read your book, I would just like to ask a question. Um, you are Russian-born and you've been brought up in different countries. You've been uh, to school in uh, Vienna. And now you live in uh, England. You've been living in, uh, in England for um, quite some while. And you've been married to an Englishman. How did it happen that uh, you have been traveling to India and how you met your teacher? And uh, what happened afterwards, how you brought up this group? You see, usually in life, we begin to think about spiritual things when something very dramatic and very tremendous happens to us. My husband died. It was my second husband. After the death of my first husband, I married my second husband. After four years after the death of my first husband, I married Charles, who was in the Navy. It was a very happy marriage. When he died, I wanted to die. I didn't want to live. Not to commit suicide, that would be nonsense. Just to, to, to sit on a stone and die. I remember it was 13 days after he died, after his funeral. And I have been sitting at home not knowing what to do, thinking in this chair he was sitting the last time. At the, at the, at the table, it was the last place where he was sitting. And then I thought, now who doesn't know that Charles is dead? All my friends knew, most of them came to the funeral. Then I thought, Cecil. So I pick up the telephone and ring Cecil, a friend. It was on Saturday. Cecil is never at home on Saturday. But that Saturday she picked up the phone and answered. So I said, Cecil, Charles died. That, does, that disturbed me. Please don't do this. Uh, so, mm. switching off, perhaps. Well, what did I say? Charles died. Yes, yeah, you, you shouldn't do that because when I am in the stream, I'm trying to tune in into something else which is not me. So please be very quiet. So she picked up the phone and came to me and she said, I am coming. And you know, I was not washed. The flat was in disorder. So I panicked. I said, please don't come. I didn't know. Take the bath first or clean first up the flat. I was in such a state, in a psychological, absolutely terrible state. But she lived very near, so I decided to, I quickly have a bath. It will be the best thing. She came in, she looked around, and she said, I uh, take you to, 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 a, uh, to a library. And she took me to a library, to a private library. It was actually the library of the Theosophical Society. She had to change a book. I saw those books, thousands of books. I was brought up in academical circles. So I thought, perhaps, perhaps when I read, perhaps I will be able to, li to live again. Perhaps I can study, do something. And she gave me a book, Life After Death. And that's how it all began. I was brought up in the Roman Catholic religion. I did not know anything about reincarnation, about karma, about the spiritual things which are so important to us now and which we all believe. And I began to read. I, began to, uh, I, I became a member of the Theosophical Society. Then I decided to go to India because uh, one branch of the Theosophical Society was in India. But somehow that didn't satisfy me. You see, 
there was this beautiful theosophical compound. There were Americans and New Zealanders and English people and Do German, all Europeans. But it was not India. I wanted to see India. Because outside the compound, I saw children with swollen tummies of hung from hunger. I saw mangy dogs dying in the street. I saw a calf gasping for breath. And I asked, what is that? Oh, they say he's dying natural death. I said, but how is that? Why is nobody looking after him? They said, oh, well, we need milk. So the calf is taken away from the cow and left there to die. It's quite natural death. That's all right. Because human beings need milk. That explanation was given to me. Well, somehow I thought Adya wasn't good enough. So I began to travel. I had money. My husband left me enough to live quite comfortably. It would have been even comfortable now with the inflation. And I asked a friend, where can I spend the rainy season where I can be quiet, where I can meditate? And I wanted to be near the mountains. I wanted to go to the Himalayas. So a friend gave me an address of a certain abbot mound. It was five miles as the crow flies from Nepal. There I stayed for seven months with a friend, uh, with Indian friends. I, I lived actually with them. First I had, a, uh, I had a villa, then everything was robbed. And those Indian friends decided it would be much better if I come and stay with them, which I did. And from there, uh, yes, in this Indi Indian French, she was telling me about a certain Miss Lillian. Very interesting person. She sleeps in ancient temples. She loves rats. All her under underwear was stolen by the Arabs. So it was uh, this sort of lie. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was interested to meet this Lillian, but she wasn't there. After staying with uh, this Indian family, I decided to travel and I went to Kashmir. <laughs> when I was in Kashmir, I received a letter from this lady where I stayed. She said, Lillian is now in Kashmir. And she gave me her address. Uh, I wrote to her, but there was no answer because I wanted to go to Amarnath Yatra, which is the pilgrimage to Amarnath. It's a Shiva temple at 14,000 feet. And this is a natural phenomenon there. There is a stalag, stalagmite which grows, increases, and decreases with the moon. So I went with the Amarnath, uh, event Amarnath Yatra. It is the full moon in August. Of course, I didn't have time for anybody else, so I just went there. And while we were traveling on horses, Lillian was telling me about her guru. Lillian was with me at that time. And she, being French, she called her Le Guru. And one day we were caught uh, in a snowstorm, and she was riding in front of me, and I was riding at the back. And she said, please, don't speak to me. I will go in Samadhi, and I will contact my teacher, and if we are in danger, uh, we will be led to safety. Well, I was very much impressed by that. but. Uh, it wasn't necessary, the snowstorm abated, and everything was all right. And this Lillian gave me the address of my teacher. I remained another summer in Kashmir. She went back to Srinagar, the capital. I traveled, traveled in the forest. I went to see the glaciers, traveled, traveled on horseback, in other, in other words, had a wonderful time. And then she gave me the address of the teacher. In the tent, I had actually a very elegant tent with a table. And I was sitting, I remember, and she was standing near me. So she said, I have to remain in Kashmir because I have to go to a religious congress. But I give you the address of my teacher. I did not know that it's going to be my teacher as well later on. And she began to write it down. And you know, when she was writing it down, 
I became terrified. I said, listen, I don't want to know his name. And it was like a kind of terror in my heart. I felt he must be without a name and without a face. Now you see, that must have been something in me which knew unconsciously. Because the ancient tradition is the teacher must be without name and without face. She smiled and she said, why don't you want to know his name? I said, well, I just don't want, I'm terrified. She smiled. She said, that is a sign. Actually, this is a sign that he's going to be my guru. I did not know that at that time. That was it. So she wrote only Mahatma and the street number. This, the, the town was Kanpur, the street, the house number, and that was all. And then, of course, after that, I went to see uh, the I went to Amritsar to see the Golden Temple. Ah, a very interesting incident, which again is one, and this is a point on the road. In Amritsar, I went to see the Golden Temple, and the young tourist guide, which the tourist office assigned to me, he said, well, you, I showed you the Golden Temple. Now, tomorrow, I'm going to show you a temple uh, Dedicated to, dedicated to the 12 martyrs of Sikh religion. We go there in the morning, which we did. People sat on a dhari. Dhari is a carpet like here. And people just sit cross-legged on the dhari. And the one which acts as a priest was reading from a great book, which is called Grand Saab, the book. And the last paragraph on the left-hand side will be written on the blackboard in Punjabi to meditate upon for the believers during the day. And this sentence went like that. To thee to whom I am going, I am going to touch thy feet and I am going to kiss thy hands, for thou will take me to God. You know, there are moments in life when one feels destiny, the finger of destiny is touching you. I became terrified. I said to myself, I don't want to know God, good heavens, no. I just go to Ceylon as I decided to go to Ceylon, and then I go back to England and go to work in the library. I'm li I, I, was, I was a librarian by profession. But of course, I did not go. I ran. The very next day, I said to the, the very same day, and I said to the tourist guy, it is far too hot, which was true. And uh, they took the first train to Delhi in the morning. Arrived in Delhi, asked the coolie, where is the next train to Kanpur? He said, just get here across, five minutes, quickly. And we just went, the train started. I traveled till next, no, till uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. And when I arrived in Kanpur, it was like coming home. I don't know if they left it in the book, it's certainly in the manuscript. I remember the rickshaw was going through the streets, and I, my heart was singing, and I was saying to myself, you're crazy. It's just an ordinary Indian town. And here you are so happy, you are coming home. My heart was beating. You are coming home, you are coming home. I did not know why. Then I went to the place which Lillian said was reserved for me by a certain Mrs. Gosh. Mrs. Gosh said she never received the letter. And that's how she took me to Pushpa. And that's how the book begins. When she said, Passing the street, she said, would you like to meet Miss Lillian's guru? I said, no, no, I was, I was sweaty, I was hot, all I wanted a cup of tea and a hot bath, or cold bath, rather not even hot. It was terribly hot. It was the last, the least thing I wanted is to meet an important person like a guru. But she already was going inside the villa. 
was a low bungalow, and three men came out, came out. One very tall, looking like a prophet. It was Munshi Ji. Then another one slightly less tall, but uh, Baisa, the guru, was still very tall. He was over six feet tall. And then somebody much smaller. That was Pandiji, as, as I knew later. And I came down from came down from the rickshaw, and something in me stood to attention. It wasn't I. Something in me just stood to attention. I was in the presence of a very great being, and that's how the book began. Then things began to happen. I don't need to speak about it. Perhaps this the book will appear now in Germany in paperback edition. So I think Rohold Verlag, is it? Yes. Yeah. Rohold Verlag. So I mean, people could read it. I don't would like to bore anybody to repeat. But what is not in the book is that after his death, I had to be alone. Actually, after his death, something tremendous happened. It was like a... It is impossible to express in words. But every leaf of the tree was an open book. Every child, every dog, the stone-throwing children, the yapping dogs, the fleas and the flies, and the sky. It was all, it was one. And I was part of that, being just at the right moment, at the right time to be, in the right place, just there. And everything was luminous and everything was magnificent. And I couldn't bear it, because I thought I was going crazy. So a friend of uh, Guruji, now dead, Professor Bhatnagar, he told me to go to a place in, which was called Kauzani in Almora district. Um, it was a Gandhi ashram. And I stayed in the room, opposite the room, where Gandhi Ji has written his Anashakti Yoga, the Yoga of Selfless Action. It was, it was a magnificent place. 240 miles of the Himalayas, the whole horizon full of mountains. I remember a Canadian came there and he said, gee, I never imagined there can be so many mountains and they could be so big. <laughs> Every one over 24,000 feet, by the way. I don't know how much that is in meters. So there I stayed. And you know, when, ba when Baisal, he liked to be called Baisa, which means elder brother. He didn't like to be called Guru. So when Baisa died, I thought he betrayed me. I had to give up everything I had. I didn't have even 100 pounds in the bank. And he will do it in that way. He will say, oh, Pandiji has to repair his roof. His wife is in Delhi hospital. She has TB and we are before the rainy period. He needs 300 rupees. So make a postal order and send him money. And all my money, thousands of pounds, went like that. So nothing remained. You know, it is difficult to believe, but I was so fascinated that I was not even afraid. I was afraid a little. Because those were my savings for my old age and of my husband. My husband, as I said, left me very well off. And nothing was left. It all flowed through his slender fingers. It was too fascinating for words. Thousands, all my investments, thousands and thousands of pounds. Give away to so and so, the other one. Children have died. Uh, the, the, I mean, just like that. And I remember when Hanka came to meet me, she's the H in the book, he did the same with her. She said, send so, so much to Delhi, to this person, or so much to. Amritsar or whatever it was, Jaipur, I think it was, not Amritsar. So he took everything away, and I had nothing. So when he died, I thought to return to the West at my age, I was nearly 60 then. I can't find a job at that age. What will I do? 
and he just died away, giving me nothing. Because the interesting part was that when he died, just three weeks before he died, speaking of spiritual life, he said, spiritual training? Nonsense. That was only a preparation. You see, before the ego goes completely, we cannot even begin to look towards the spiritual path. I didn't know that. I remember this sentence, I was terribly angry. He didn't begin, my goodness me, I went through all this little bit. But apparently, he says, it wasn't even spiritual life begun. But in the Himalayas, I don't remember, there must be an entry, either September or October it was, where I mention very discreetly, with one sentence only, the fact that I could contact my teacher in meditation. That was an experience never to be forgotten. He had no human shape anymore, he was an energy, he was a power. But there was duality. I knew there was the teacher and me. And the whole of me was just like that. It was too tremendous for words. And from then on, the training began. Only now I know it, after 23 years. But at the beginning, there was duality. There was the teacher and there was me. It was a wonderfully comfortable situation, like a daddy whom you can ask, and the answer is given. Mind you, I could never ask for myself. This is the law, but I could ask for others. I paid with myself for it. I paid the price, not the money. He said to give up possessions is easy, to give up yourself. In utter surrender, that is something. So I paid the price. I have to ask for any one of you. I can ask, and if it is permitted, it will be given. Now, why permitted? There is such thing as karma. He said one day, we can heal everything, but we cannot heal everybody. Karma permitting. You see, the great saint knows it. So I just needed to ask, I didn't need any wisdom, I just asked. And if karma was permitted, things did happen. And everybody present here knows that miracle happens in this group all the time. Even quite recently with Miriam, she knows that it is perfectly true. But as I just mentioned, there was duality at the beginning. Later on, and I must confess, I didn't notice it. Gradually, very gradually, and it is very difficult to put in words, there was no duality. It just was. When help was needed, something happened and my mind accepted it without rebellion, knowing very well that it was not my mind, it was not Tweedy. It was something entirely different. So I cannot be proud of it. But there was no duality. You see, I can only explain it technically like that, like I read it in the Theosophical books. At one time of the training, the Atma, or the Higher Self of the disciple, is united with the Higher Self of the teacher. Only one remains, there is no duality. And this is the access to the teacher. Also, somewhere in Theosophical books, it is said that, I think Madame Blavatsky mentioned it, that part of her remains somewhere with her teacher. I know exactly how it happens. She uses the words, what you see in front of you is an illusion, it's only a shell. The best part of me remains with the teacher. I'm quoting now Madame Levatsky. Now, how it happens, 
in my case, I do not know. I don't think it's quite like that. But something always remained there. Otherwise, the connection is not possible. I think that's how there is no duality. This is the best thing I can say. It is very puzzling, but it's very true. And the presence of our teacher is tremendously evident here. Um, Hanka told me several years ago, what happens in this group, I will never be astonished. Because miracles constantly happen and happen and happen. Miracles with him, with the hearts of people. Another thing, we Sufis, we do not work on the physical plane. We work from the level of the soul. And sometimes the physical body can be a little bit neglected. You see, all the other lines of yoga, they work from the physical body into the inner planes. We work from the inner plane downwards. It is much more, I say downwards, it is neither downwards nor upwards, of course, this is nonsense. I say downwards to say the earthy plane, because somehow we are conditioned to think that spirituality is heaven and he is the earth. Of course, everything is absolutely interpenetrating. The spirit and matter utterly interpenetrating. I think it is very beautifully described in the book of Yoga Vashishta, one of the great scriptures of Hinduism. I think I can ask something. You can always cut it out. Would you like to? I have nothing more to say. It seems to me I am empty. Ask again. Somebody who comes here to the group and who does not have an outer guru, because in our world, here in the Western world, um, we don't have the gurus running around. Although there are some who are advertising for themselves. You say that your guruji is present here. How? And it's said in the scriptures that um, the outer guru leads you to the inner guru. That's right. <coughs> so each person who comes here will find a way to the inner guru. Yes. It's all individual in the path of the soul. We all are disciples of God. So we don't necessarily have to have an outer guru to be put on the spiritual path. But it is useful to have someone who is just one step ahead of you. Because as this person goes ahead further, it pulls you, it, you also come. Great gurus are not necessary. It is only someone who knows a little more than you. It works exactly like on the physical plane. There will be teachers of kindergarten, there will be university teachers. And you know, it doesn't work to go to India or anywhere else in search for the Guru. It doesn't work. It is the teacher who has to find you. He told me that he dreamt of me many years ago, of not only of me, of course, of everybody else who comes to me. But because he was talking to me, he mentioned me. He said, you should have come long ago. I don't understand why you didn't. Well, my destiny was like that. He, of course, understood why he didn't. He only said like that for the sake of saying. I have my karmas, which I had to pay off. That was all. And he also mentioned to you, which is written in the book, that we can make it within one lifetime. Yes. What is it that he mentions? We can, in, we can realize the truth in one lifetime. If one is not too dense and not too stupid, I quote him, or not too lazy, we can, you can realize the truth within 10 years. And, he said, if you do not realize it, I come at the moment of death and I fetch the soul. Now that, I think, is a covenant of a very great being. Now you will say, now how is it possible 
to realize in one life when Buddha needed 700 lives to realize it. You know, it is a very simple explanation. Great truth can only be expressed in absolute paradoxes. The simplicity in it is that you are attracted to this path if it is your last life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be attracted. If you are attracted to this path, it's your last life. And you can achieve it in 10 years' time. But for doing that, of course, we will have to have a certain discipline that would be to meditate regularly and to live in selfless love in the outside world. Yes. Mm. There is a silent meditation. We are called the silent Sufis. Mm -hmm. We meditate silently. We don't need any props like dancing or singing or anything. It is silent meditation. There, when I receive instructions, people get mantras or zikr. Zikr and mantra, by the way, is the same thing. It's only one is Persian, the other is in, in Sanskrit. And really, that's all. If we meditate sincerely and completely, the meditation, especially this meditation which we practice, is like a yeast. Everything which is dark within the human being will come up, will come up on the surface. Everybody has trouble the first two years. Absolutely everybody. Because all the darkness which is in the every human being will come up and will be scooped up like foam, from dirty foam from water or from anything. When even when you cook a soup, you have to scoop up what comes up. This is a very strange meditation. Apparently, we are sitting silently and uh, trying to control the mind. But everybody has difficulties. There will be doubt, doubts, there will be jealousies. Terrible jealousies, terrible doubts. People are very often against me. You have no idea how many things people told me, how, how rude people can be to me. I have very broad back, it doesn't matter, I understand. If one reads my book, how rude I was to my teacher. I couldn't, with our Western mind, certain things we just cannot accept. We are brought up on the mental level especially if we brought up in academical circles, it's uh, quite difficult. Since we have to forget everything which we've learned, and of course something which I've learned, I think that's my own reality and I want to keep it and I want to give it away. Very true. How does go the Chinese proverb? Before you begin the meditation, you must forget what meditation is. This is Chinese proverb. In India, when you go to ashrams and when you meet teachers, very often they are talking about a technical process of realization that is when Kundalini is awakened and when Kundalini is working through the different chakras, which starts in the Mulata <coughs> chakra, moving <coughs> upwards towards the Sahasrana. But now, reading your book, I find that we should just uh, concentrate on the heart, the heart yes. chakra, is the chakra from which we can start and each and every other chakra will be open, will be worked upon when the time is ready for it to be worked upon. Yes. yes, this is this method. There are different methods. This is this particular method of yoga. Is there are other yoga, the other methods of yoga are just as effective as this one. Yes? The shisha, will he or she be initiated or no. just simply come and be? If you are initiated, how will you be nothing? Mm. One day, it was actually very nice, one, it was quite an interesting incident. One of his disciples, Panditji, he was very proud that day, and he said to me, you know, Baisab initiated me and I became his disciple. I said, yes. He said, I brought some uh, coconut and some prashad, yes, and all this, and now I became his disciple. Why don't you ask to become his disciple? I said, I don't feel I need it. He treats me like a disciple. I don't see why I should. 
So the next time when he spoke to me, this is the Indian tradition, you must not address the teacher unless he addresses you first. So one day he talked to me about something and I told him, Baisab, um, Pandiji told me, etc., etc., etc. But I feel I shouldn't ask you to become a disciple because I feel you treat me like a disciple. He said, never ask me, my dear, he said. If, I, if you become a disciple, how will you learn to be nothing? Now there is a great esoteric truth in that. We work entirely with the divine power. That's why Sufis on this line of yoga are exceedingly powerful. Um, there are two ways of working. You can work with yogic power, which is uh, you achieve so everything with you by your own volition. You practice and you become and you, I mean, you, the result is the same. You can achieve it by yogic power or by divine power. By divine power, you do nothing except you surrender completely. And you must keep yourself surrender completely and utterly, which I can assure you is full-time job. Because the little ego is always lurking just behind the next corner. It's very difficult. We have to become nothing before life, before people, above all, before the beloved. We call this infinite power the beloved. Neither judge, nor creator, nor friend, the beloved. The most intimate relationship of our hearts. That's why I think this particular line of yoga is very powerful and very effective. But we must keep ourselves completely surrendered. Which, as you said, is very, very difficult. Yeah. Here again, the terrible paradox. Complete surrender, complete nothingness. Yes to everything. Which is the greatest power. I find this path is especially difficult for men. Especially for the Western men. The education, you know, the competition. I am better than thou in sport, in everything. For women, somehow, it is easier. He explains in one place, it, I think it is one place in the book, how uh, the woman can reach reality just by being a woman. So I'm very glad, said, oh, really wonderful. <laughs> oh, no, he said. <laughs> it's not like that. It is difficult, just as difficult for everybody. To men, I give many practices. The woman need only one practice, the detachment from the worldly things. Because we, by our very nature, we are attached to comfort, to money, to children. Because a woman has to bear children. We need security. A woman is attached to security. If a woman is prepared to give up security, because spiritual life is utmost insecurity, no man's land. Niemand land, glaube ich, heißt das Deutsch. It's like walking on water, walking on air. You have nothing under your feet. It's a chasm of fire. Actually, the, the title, the chasm of fire, is from Gregory of Nyssa, the Christian mystic. Uh, he, was one, uh, he was contemporary of St. Augustine. He said, the path of love is like a bridge of hair across the chasm of fire. Of hair, you know. You walk on it and it falls. You fall into the fire. Very insecure indeed. And especially since we still have the understanding of time and we think mm -hmm. time is future, time is past, time is present. And most of the time when we are in our world, we are out of the now. We are either in the past or we are in the future. And I think this is one of the difficult steps to renounce the past, to renounce the future in a certain way, to be in the here and now, and to really live the moment. And I think we all have our difficulties with that. You say it's very beautiful. It's exactly like that. We have great difficulties with that. So we overcome these difficulties by calming our mind, 
By stealing our mind? Yes. Only by stealing completely, by perhaps I can say transcending the thinking faculty of the mind, can we reach in the different space where spiritual experiences are possible. And this is done entirely through meditation. It takes lifetime. People come here sometimes for two, three years, and they think, somebody sent me a telex, you know. Read your book, arrive in three days. <laughs> well, my publisher forwarded the letter. I answered, of course, of course, with my full address. She wrote to me in English. I answered in German. I said, what? Instant illumination, I said. Why was the telex necessary? It's a lifetime's job, my dear. You are welcome to come, but it won't happen tomorrow and not in three days, and perhaps not, only, not even in 30 years. She didn't come, by the way, you see. <laughs> <laughs> you poor darling. <laughs> but of course, it's helpful to come here. I, personally, I do feel the, the Shakti very strongly, and uh, also the week that I have not been here, that I have been away traveling, I felt the, the instant link between the lineage and uh, between myself. And uh, even as I wanted to prepare for this talk, I, as I said before, I, I couldn't write things down because I either fell asleep or my mind went still. Um, it really, to me, it's uh, very interesting to find these things happening um, because there is one person which has the name and the person thinks, oh, I must do this I'm, because I want to do something good for other people, give them a good treat in, in presenting a person like you and saying, ah, oh, look, she's a beautiful person, but I must do it very intellectually, very nice and so on, just to present her. And then I find I can't do it. <laughs> And that is what we call the yo-yo syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Which happens on every level. Wonderful meditation. <laughs> <laughs> or tremendous nearness to the beloved. It, you see, spiritual life is exactly like everything in nature. It's subjected to the law of nature. There is like the tide and the sea, like the day and night. There is tremendous nearness to the beloved, and the soul is happy, and we are walking on clouds, and then suddenly there is nothing there. You are suspended naked over a, over, a, over a chasm of an abyss. You can't pray, and God doesn't exist, and everything is cold, and everything is horrible. This is one, another aspect of the yo-yo syndrome. And we, we have it on every level, you know. This is a path of the mystics. And uh, people have wonderful experiences, really wonderful experiences. Great visions, great moments of oneness. But we have to work hard for it through meditation. But outwardly there is very little discipline. I have uh, noticed this, that each and every one is comforting him or herself in a way that's the, the best. Um, whereas in ashrams we have the instructions to sit in siddhasana with an erected spine because it's good for kundalini floating up and down to Ida uh, and Pingala and all these instructions. And uh, here people are just lying around moving and sitting and uh, uh, in, don't mostly sit in any yogic uh, posture. So um, Whereas, uh, whereas uh, Western I find in ashrams where people sitting very straight and beautifully is really not needed. No. Nothing is needed except the desire for truth. And they want the truth as badly as a drowning man wants air. They will realize it in a split second. That's all. Just to, uh, to ask you, how do you give instructions for meditation? Or what do you say, since you say it's a still meditation, yeah. there's no mantra? Yes, I think it's an important question, we should say that. So I just, uh, I have actually a German paper on it. Yeah, I can give it to you, it's translated into German. The Dhyana meditation. I can say it here in English. 
we have to sit or lie down or recline or sit cross leg as we like provided that the physical body is completely comfortable and will not disturb us after we are completely relaxed we fill our hearts with love <coughs> Best of all, of course, if you can think of the great beloved God. But it is rather a very abstract concept, and for the beginner it's rather difficult. So I say, think of someone whom you deeply and absolutely love. And just concentrate on this person and fill your heart with rich, warm feeling of love. While you are doing that, the mind will be occupied with doing that, and you are all right. But once you just sit there still, feeling love in your heart, the mind will begin to work. Oh, I forgot to buy potatoes. <laughs> oh, I have to bring uh, my suit to the dry cleaners, and so on and so forth. Now, imagine you get hold of this thought and drown it within the feeling of love in the heart. And there must be nothing here. I usually give uh, people um, perhaps a little help. Imagine an empty television screen. Just in, fr in front of your closed eyes there is an empty white television screen. And imagine every thought comes on this television screen, appears on the television screen. Get hold of it, drown it in love, and the television screen is empty. And go on doing it. It's a spiritual exercise and also an exercise in willpower. It is one of the methods of stealing the mind. I don't say the method. There is no such thing as a royal road to God. Uh, it's just one of the very effective ways re to reach reality. That's all. And it definitely works. A uh, little other question. How can we help other people? By being ourselves. Mm -hmm by sweeping in front of our doorstep. Man improve thyself and thou wilt improve the world. No good to say in criticizing and trying to improve the world because we can do nothing. But if I, if I am good and you are good and everybody else, there will be no wars. If we live like Jesus taught us to live, he was the greatest guru. Guruji used to quote him all the time. You know, I was a very bad Christian. I hope I am a much better Christian now since I was with a, with a yogi who had nothing to do with Christianity. This is just, just that. Be yourself. Jesus, he and his disciples, they were healing. Is that something that is happening on the path too? Guruji used to say, <coughs> we can heal everything, but we cannot heal everybody. Karma comes in there, you see. So the healing is done in a different way. You see, what is a disease? You are ill at ease. You must be aligned with your inner vehicles. Everything must be aligned. Then you will be very healthy. This is a fact. The health, the, the health improves when you come to this path. Incredibly so. But we are not healer as such. I cannot heal you if you are ill. But I can create the situation in which you can heal yourself, that I can. I can put a spark in your heart that there is such aspiration, such a longing, uh, that you will do it yourself. We had a charming incident, which I always repeat, because it was really charming. An elderly man came to this group, it was I think two years ago, one of our girls, Anati, was sit had happened to sit near him. And I was, it was on Friday, and Friday I'm very busy because we have about 60 people here, so I have no time. I was spinning like a top. And uh, this man sat there in the corner, and Anati happened to sit near him. So he said, 
is this old lady teaching? Anati said, no. So he said, is she lecturing? Anati said, no. He said, well, does she give us practices? She said, no, not at all. So he said, but what are we supposed to do? And Anati said, you have to do everything yourself. The poor man never came again. <laughs> How to do yourself, actually, a tremendous inner help is given. The human being is guided from within. How that happens, it's very esoteric and very long to explain. But it happens. God dwells within you as you. Yes. And also you see, that is correct. And also, you see, we meet. We are meeting in the night when we are free. Here lies the great secret of this particular path of yoga. You see, I just didn't want to tell you that. And in this very moment, I received instructions say, so I'm telling you that. I hesitated. I waited for instructions. We meet in the night. The Sufi says, the king is not in his palace, the prisoner is not in his cell. When the soul is free, we go where we are attracted. By desiring something, we create a vacuum. Look how here, again, the law of nature works and how the reincarnation and karma can be explained. When you take out air, air will flow in. When you take out, when you take out uh, water, water will flow in. When you create a desire, the desire has to be fulfilled somewhere, sometime. We scatter ourselves in millions of desires. Look, from morning till evening, we have desires, desires, desires. If we analyze ourselves and you know how to control the mind, we constantly are full of desires. Now, if we have only one desire for truth, we are omnipotent. And the time comes when you have to be careful what you think, because it becomes. It's frightening. So when before you go to sleep, you desire, to be there where the teacher is, you will be there. Would it be advisable to read some books such as you have been studying theosophical books? Uh, I quote Baisa. He said, before you realize, books are useless. Hmm. Because the more the mind is stuffed with knowledge, the less it is uh, inclined to surrender. After realiza realization, books are very useful. They make, uh, uh, they make you more articulate. If you wish to read something, well, do. As I say, this is a free path. People come here and they, they go also to other schools. I know where they are going, but I will never ask. And I will never say, and, that's just, and, I, and I frankly don't care. They can do what they like provided they do this meditation at least some time. And also, the, there is one, you see, apparently it's very free, but it is not quite. If I see that a human being is not progressing, they ask to go. And, ab and above all, if they don't live the ethics of this life, of this path, the ethics is tremendous. Do you know uh, that if I have chairs, and I personally do not need chairs, I am stealing. If I am eating more than I need, I am stealing. And no use telling me, oh look, if you don't eat it, I throw it away. Throw it away, they are hungry cats, hungry dogs, or worms, their life the same. One day a young man came from, a journalist from Radio, uh, from Radio Delhi, and asked him a few questions. And he asked him a question about Ahimsa, which is harmlessness. He said, Ahimsa is not really not killing, not only not killing. Not killing is only on the fringe of Ahimsa. It's not so very important. 
the real ahimsa is not harming yourself. So the young man, he said to him, but uh, Guru Maharaj, how is that possible? I wouldn't be an idiot to harm myself. And he said, oh yes, you do, constantly, by creating habits. If you create habit, a habit, you are harming yourself because you put yourself in prison. If you say, I cannot be without tea, well, I or without a cigarette, I put myself into prison. You are not free anymore. That is real ahimsa, that is real harmlessness. Not to return a library book in time we are stealing. You know, to live the ethics of this part of yoga is very difficult. It's tremendously difficult. So some human beings, of course, when they commit something which is quite unethical, they are asked to go. Otherwise, it's all right. We all are human and who is perfect who should throw the first stone. There is another thing, you know, when you are with a teacher, once one has to face oneself and realize how much darkness is within, one cannot judge anybody anymore. One just cannot. Each time one thinks, oh well, I did the same or even a little bit worse than this human being and one try one just tries to help, that's all. And then there is this question of getting rid of the ego of the ego. This is again a very interesting point. One cannot get rid of the ego. One can only Keep it in check and use it. Because what is the ego? This is the I, the me in the center of the mental body. Me different from you. Only in the state of deep meditation that disappears. But we are not intended to pass our life in unconscious state. That is quite impossible. There is the universal consciousness, but not individual consciousness. So one doesn't get rid of the ego. One knows it is there and one uses it uh, according to one's will. It's actually very creative. If you know how to use it, it's, it's tremendous power. Also the darkness in us, our evils, the shadow, like Carl Jung says it, is tremendously creative. And there comes the time when one is never really angry. But you can be apparently very angry. You put all your ego and sweep it around, you see, so to, so to say. But really and truly, in your heart, there can be, can be no real anger anymore. Or is it because you feel that each and every heart, in each and every body, in each and everything is just the same? If I hurt you, I hurt myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to? Oh, sit there. Why should you hide? Beautiful young ladies should you hide. Shouldn't he be He or she comes to the door, so to speak has a dream, or several dreams. And each dream is a pointer to something in the person, or something that is going to happen. And I myself had certain dreams, which at the time opened my eyes and told me that here is something absolutely vital, something that can change your mind. And some of the dreams were statements of where you stand and what you have to do, where you are going to be guided. Some of them were very hopeful. They gave me tremendous hope. And also they showed me uh, the, the symbol, the mountain. You have to climb the mountain. But 
one managed to climb the mountain and that showed it is you're going to get somewhere i mean in in symbols of dreams but everybody had dreams and uh, it made you realize that these dreams are the expressions of your soul. Your soul is talking to you in dreams. This is what I found. Dreams are not something to be thrown away as rubbish. We have to discriminate, of course, which is the dream that tells you the right thing and which is not. But some of the, of the group in those days, they had absolutely like myths or legends stories, marvelous, even nowadays one of them has that kind of thing, the teaching dreams, which tell you quite a lot, and you may not understand everything, and maybe ten years later, suddenly you understand, oh, this is what is was meant. And it's the same with one reading Mrs. Tweedy's book, over and over again, certain experiences, you seem to understand with your mind, that that is nothing. Suddenly when you reread it, you understand with your heart, and because something has happened within you, some experience has happened, you have lived through something, and suddenly you see this experience, and the two coalesce, and something opening within yourself, which is like an illumination, and which is absolutely marvelous. Well, all these things are happening on this path, but we don't speak much about it. And people who come here, they don't know, they don't realize all these things, but they're all within us. And during the night, all sorts of things happen. And one of us, I know, actually dreams for other people. They are messengers in her dreams for other people, as well as, of course, for herself. And she has certain um, teachings of the esoteric. Outwardly, she doesn't know anything about the esoteric doctrines which I have studied with my mind only. But she receives these teachings, and then she asks, what does it mean? And I thought, oh, this is the esoteric doctrine that I have studied. And she gets it from within, from the depth of her soul. It's absolutely wonderful when you put everything together, how we are all going on and on slowly, each one according to his own line which may be different but it all meets in the one point which is during the night during this complete stillness of our souls and mind when we receive this tremendous invigoration from the teacher is it wise to write down dreams when you wake up i think if you feel that the dream is very important then yes all the, I must admit that all the important dreams I had, I never wrote them down because they were so engraved on my forget. mind, I never forgot them. About six, that's all. But they had a tremendous impact of, on me and I shall never forget them. But for many people, I think it would be a good idea to write them down and then go over them, let's say two years later, because uh, more meaning will come out of them. Is it also a practice in this group that when you have a dream and you want it to be explained, you come and ask Miss Tweedy and... Um, yes, and sometimes Mrs. Him. Tweedy does, does not explain it. <laughs> 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 she keeps you on your... It's up to you, because she knows that you ought to realize what it means. But sometimes uh, uh, some of us, like several of us, try to find out the meaning because it's difficult. So one will have one interpretation, another one, another one. But if it doesn't feel right for the person, then the person will have to think it over and perhaps have another, gets another dream, which helps him or her to find the real meaning. So I find that this path is a very spontaneous path. Yes. Things happen very spontaneous. Yes. You don't work on a technique. No, no. I would like to add something about dreams. Mrs. Tweedy sometimes used to disappear. And something must have been happening very much with her because people in the group were dreaming. And when you listened 
to individual dreams. They told you what was happening to the group as a group. They were each telling you a little bit about how the group <coughs> was going on. Not just one, 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 but all together. And there's a question that arises again. Is it very important, or I think it is very important for the time that we're coming in for the new age, that we shift from individual to group understanding, that we will be working in groups? Yes. I entirely agree with you. It is extremely important to work in groups. It is extremely important to belong to a group, especially a group like that. It is like living in a castle where you are protected from your little self. When you are amongst people who are of the same idea and the same aspirations as yourself, you are protected from yourself, from your little self, from the ego. It is like living in a castle, says the Upanishad. It is, one in, one, it is in one of the minor Upanishads. And she spoke of disappearing. She meant I was going away for, for sometimes a very long time without telling anybody that I was going away. I didn't really plane. disappear. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes for many months, just going away, nobody knew where I was. But that really wouldn't matter. <laughs> 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 of course, now the reaction, but uh, it shouldn't really matter. It, it, it is like saying that in, um, it wouldn't matter that there is no sun in a solitary system. How? Yeah, it matters tremendously. The gravitational pull is completely thrown. <laughs> it just really. But shouldn't, again, uh, isn't that a point where we should just let go? I'm thinking now Miss Tweedy is there, she's staying with the group, and She's always there that uh, the same as you wrote in the book, uh, as you wrote in the diary. Um, I will only be with you, whatever happens, I just want to be with you, I want to be where you are, and when you leave, t uh, please take me with you, that we should even go beyond that. I agree with you. This is the idea why one disappears, to teach people to stand alone. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is uh, one of... Um, the teaching methods on this line of yoga. One leaves the human being entirely alone, without any help. We have to stand completely alone. But on different paths it happens that after a certain while this also happens, that you, are, if you are attached to a guru, you will find a certain time in your sadhana where there is no help and where you know that he's not there or she and that you, ha that you have to cross a certain distance of time where you have to go through yourself, self-sufficient. And this is a very important part of sadhana, to have absolutely no help whatsoever. Very important. This is again a yo-yo syndrome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you are, don't know which way to turn. But as you were talking about the sparkle in your life, in your heart, there's the <coughs> longing that you have, the longing for the one that takes you through. Or even, does that even go away? That should never go away. Because the longing in your heart is one of the qualities which the soul brings with itself in the incarnation. You see, we come in the incarnation with two desires only the will to live, and the will to worship. The will to worship is the love aspect within the human heart, and the will to live is instinct of self-preservation. <coughs> Every other desire the human being acquires after having, having been born in this world. But those two things we bring with us, and the longing, is exactly this love aspect which will take us back to our source. For the source and the goal are one. You see, it is a complete closed circle. We come from a perfect source and we go to a perfect goal. 
we as human beings do this, but uh, also all the other systems that we live together with, uh, with uh, the the animal part, the uh, the plants, and the whole uh, planet as as a whole system, don't they have to go through cycles like that, like that too? Yes. Everything in nature and everything in yoga is the same, and mm -hmm. and spiritual life is absolutely subjected to the laws of nature. Some of the great Mahatmas, they wrote them, um, they don't want to be uh, in Samadhi and they don't want to to be in um, in this state where they have nothing to do, just that they are for themselves in God. That They say, I will not be in this state before each and every soul has come to this part to, or to this understanding too. Yes. I think it is very similar because our teacher told us we are a band of workers, we have to work for humanity. We, uh, we, those of us who reach this stage, we have to remain with the teacher and we will always be working for humanity. It's the same idea as the Bodhisattva idea in Buddhism, on this line of yoga, most definitely.